The death of Thomas Ince just after his 42nd birthday was as legendary as some of the movies he produced. As with many Hollywood legends, it didn't have much truth to it, and it involved the famous parties of Marion Davies, which we will explore in this video. Born into a show business family on November 16, 1882 in Newport, Rhode Island, Ince rose from failure as a stage actor to success as the first film tycoon. In the 1910s and 1920s, he pioneered the system of movie making still in use today before he left a yacht owned by newspaper mogul William Randolph Hearst. Thomas Ince died several days later, his body quickly cremated. Even before his funeral, suspicions mounted about his death. The rumor mill churned out the story that the married Hearst believed his 25 years junior mistress, Marion Davies, cheated on him with Charlie Chaplin. Chaplin had actually romanced Davies in 1925, a year later, on the set of the film Xander. But there's a question whether Hearst ever knew about that. Hearst has been described as a man who kept his true personal life and feelings under wraps, so it's difficult to discern what he truly believed. Davies and Chaplin joined Ince and his wife on Hearst's boat after a rendezvous for costume shopping at Catalina Island. The boat Oneida had been lit that November 1924 night by Japanese lanterns hung by Hearst himself. Rumors surfaced that Hearst shot Thomas Ince by accident, intending to shoot Davies, Chaplin, or both. To make matters worse, Charles Chaplin had inserted himself as a confidant to Hearst's wife Millicent, and their letters can be read to today. Why did Chaplin have it out for Hearst, taking his lover and cozying up to his wife at the same time? Was Chaplin trying to influence the California populist Hearst with his Zionist views? Ince entered the family business at age six, acting and later singing at funerals and weddings. His father, John Ince, started out as a vaudeville comedian, but then worked as a theatrical agent. His mother sang comic opera under the stage name Emma Brennan or Emma Jones. Thomas made his Broadway debut at age 15 and then formed an unsuccessful vaudeville company taking cues from his father. At 28, he talked his way into a job with a small independent film company. At the time, patent holders on film tried to crush independent producers. And you can learn more about this in the Pennsylvania film industry video on this channel. To get away from the intellectual property disputes, Ince traveled to Cuba with Mary Pickford and Owen Moore to make movies. But only in Hollywood could Thomas Ince make the films he yearned to make, Westerns and Civil War dramas. The Civil War is one of the quintessential American stories. Brother against brother, agitated by mass media, communists and outsiders, the apathy of politicians and the passion of the people, the devastation of reconstruction that continues to this day. Civil War battles are hardly taught outside of the American South. And even then with critical race theory, the lessons are largely manipulated to focus on slavery. The Civil War is the story Ince, a New Englander, wanted to tell, maybe due to his lack of education in the subject. Ince borrowed a suit from a friend and a large diamond ring from a jeweler and walked into the offices of the New York Motion Picture Company sometime after 1910. Why would a diamond impress a group like the New York Motion Picture Company? The firm had opened a studio to make westerns on the West Coast. Ince got the job. Thomas Ince, his young wife Nell, and a small entourage went to Edendale, California to make these films. Nell would later build the Chateau Elysee in Los Angeles as a luxury long-term residential apartment house for movie stars. In Edendale, Ince began to revolutionize movie making. He invented the shooting script. He then acquired 460 acres and created the first movie studio called Inceville. It had sound stages, offices, sets, dressing rooms, and a commissary. He hired a Wild West touring show, replete with cowboys, cattle, and Indians, who set up their teepees on the property. 
The teepees sat cheek by jowl with a Swiss landscape, aka the Santa Monica Mountains, a Japanese village, a Puritan settlement, mansions and cottages, as well as a Scottish church. Ince went on to organize production methods, putting the producer in charge of the film instead of the director and cameraman. He also invented the five reel film when two reels were the standard of the day, lengthening movies so that more stories could be told. Inceville, anyone who has ever checked a traffic app or looked for directions on the way up the Western coast from Santa Monica to Topanga or Malibu has seen the name on the map, but it doesn't really exist anymore. The only way to visit this particular corner of the twilight zone is in the dusty old reels of silent films. Established in 1911, Innsville was one of the first movie studios. It was built at the intersection of what is now Sunset Boulevard and Pacific Coast Highway. It covered 18,000 acres at its peak and included housing for 700. This is not a new idea to house workers in the same place where they work. The temporary population was always shifting at Innsville, but included film crews, and as many as 100 Lakota Sioux, brought in from Oklahoma to work as extras in Ince's popular Westerns. Having these Native Americans on film in traditional costume and with traditional horseback riding methods is a little discussed gem today, and it was all made possible by Ince. Ince had a hand in almost every aspect of the films he produced. He worked on scripts, cinematography, and directed. He even wrote the title cards. At Innsville, he often rode his horse from one film shoot to another, sometimes directing from the saddle. His wife, Eleanor, or Nell, was often at his side. She had an active role in the business like many women in film at the time. Ince, christened by media the Napoleon of Innsville and the King of the Westerns, built offices for himself and his staff, camps for the extras, luxurious bungalows for his stars, a cafeteria to feed the army of employees, sheds to store film equipment, and props that included carts, wagons, stagecoaches, and a fleet of prairie schooners. He believed in treating his workers well, a stark contrast to the media moguls of today. There was also stabling for hundreds of horses, as well as corrals for oxen, bison, and other miscellaneous livestock. In the book Pacific Palisades, Where the Mountains Meet the Sea, local historian Catherine LeHue wrote that Ince kept herds of cattle and raised feed and garden produce. Supplies of every sort were needed to house and feed a veritable army of actors, directors, and subordinates. This is largely unheard of in a time when there are hardly any company cafeterias anymore, and companies push vegan and vegetarian slop on their employees instead of meat. Also, how many film producers know how to raise cattle? Movies were a brand new industry and art form, and Ince was a pioneer, establishing many of the filmmaking techniques and conventions that we take for granted today. He was the first producer to have his own complete film studio and the first to have multiple crews working on different projects at the same time. This hadn't been seen by SNA studios in Chicago, for example. There were always at least two or three films in production at Innsville, and the site seems to have been a non-stop party. Intrepid tourists made the trip to, in the hope of seeing Western film star William S. Hart, a longtime friend of Ince from both men's early years in New York and a major part of the success of Inceville from its inception. Legendary film femme fatale Louise Glaum was also a major draw. She was one of Hollywood's first vamps. Dignitaries were entertained with rodeos and picnics. Aspiring actors arrived in the mostly vain hope of being discovered, their dreams fueled by rags to riches stories in the newspapers of the day. Those fortunate to have a car traveled in style up the coast from Santa Monica. Everyone else took the red car trolleys as far as the long wharf at the base of Temescal Canyon and either walked the rest of the way or caught a ride in one of the studio cars that would go back and forth some public transportation. Some of the earliest reports of traffic accidents on the coast route involved visitors to Innsville. Theater actress Billy Burke created a front page news sensation when she arrived at Innsville in 1915. 
The actress is best remembered now for her performance as Glinda, the Good Witch, in the 1939 film Wizard of Oz, but she was an Edwardian actress first. She arrived in Los Angeles on a private rail car attended by her maid and was wined and dined by Ince himself at Inceville, then swept off, swept off for a luxurious holiday on Catalina in an effort to get her to sign with the studio. She did. Burke's first film with Ince, the romantic comedy drama Peggy, was a smash hit for the newly renamed Triangle Pictures Company. There's some dispute and some argue that the Triangle Pictures Company was founded after Inceville burned, but some others say that it was concurrent. Burke delighted audiences. The film Peggy featured her scandalously attired in pajamas, a daring fashion choice that caused pearl clutching in many towns and did a lot to popularize pajamas for women everywhere. It wasn't so much the wearing of pajamas, but the showing of such casual wear on screen. The film is one of many from the silent era that didn't survive, but it propelled Burke to cinema stardom. She rapidly became one of the highest paid film actresses of the silent era. Despite the successes and 800 films created, Inceville was plagued with problems. In 1915, a wildfire burned through Inceville, destroying many buildings. Thomas Ince was attacked by other media moguls who thought he was dominating the movie scene. In February 1916, a fire broke out in the cutting room next to Ince's office, badly injured the filmmaker and eight of his employees. This was just the start to some of Ince's health problems. Early nitrate film was highly flammable, but the blaze may have been started by an arsonist aligned with a rival studio. There was a fire the same night at Ince's brand new Culver City studio. Who was starting all these fires? Was someone intimidated by Ince's independent, totally self-sustaining studio when New York banks were itching to get their hands on the lucrative movie industry? In April of 1916, a landslide north of Santa Monica Canyon cut off access to the film studio for several weeks, further delaying filming and rebuilding work. In 1917, three crew members were killed and three more seriously injured when a mudslide caused scaffolding to collapse on the site of a William S. Hart Western. A third devastating fire occurred in October 1923. This was a Santa Ana-driven wildfire. The Los Angeles Daily News reported the incident on October 15, 1923, and stated the fire ignited at the top of Santa Inez Canyon and burned all the way to the sea. It virtually wiped out Innsville, a well-known collection of motion picture sets. The article states, only one building, a church front made of stone, remained after the fire had spent itself. Some accounts state that part or all of Innsville had already burned in July of 1922. There aren't any news reports of a 1922 fire that could be found, but filming appears to have stopped at the famous studio in 1920, and it no longer appeared in the news. Whether there was anything left to burn in 1923 or not, Innsville became a ghost town. The stone church built for the film Peggy in 1915 endured for another decade as a local landmark. Unfortunately, it was pulled down in October 1933. In a 1919 interview in the San Francisco Call, silent film star Dorothy Dalton described Innsville as the most romantic of all motion picture encampments. Today, all that is left of Innsville is the name on the map, the ghost of a short-lived but larger-than-life chapter in American cinema that influences us to this day. Many of the films shot at Innsville have not survived, but William Hart's allegorical Western Hell's Hinges, which you can find at the Library of Congress, released in 1916, offers a glimpse of Innsville in its heyday. Ince's big budget 1916 extravaganza, Civilization, has also survived as well as Custer's Last Fight, a must watch for any Civil War fan. So fires eventually destroyed Innsville, but Thomas Ince's Triangle Studios with Mac Sennett and D.W. Griffith lived on. 
1923, he moved from Innsville to the studios in Culver City that would become MGM. On the lot he built would later be filmed such classics as Gone with the Wind, King Kong, Lassie, and Citizen Kane, supposedly based on his friend Hearst. Thomas Ince then formed Paramount Pictures with Adolf Zukor, who Hearst would also partner with. Then he moved on to form his own studio again. At Thomas H. Ince Studios, he made a few memorable films, such as Anna Christie and Human Wreckage, but he lost power and influence to competing studios backed by big banks and New York usury, as well as family connections by those big banks. By 1924, the rumor mill said Thomas Ince was edging towards bankruptcy. Supposedly, he wanted to make a deal with Hearst, who had also dealt with Zucor, to rescue his fortunes. Hearst was very into the movie industry, being a proud Californian, and always looking for a new smash vehicle for his mistress, Marion Davies. Davies wanted to pay, be Peter Pan. But playwright J.M. Barry, who you can learn about on this channel, had his eye set on Lillian Gish, and so that fell through. Maybe Ince had the next big book already picked out. Why did Hearst love Marion so much he was willing to spend so much money on her? Was it because Marion Davies matched his ambition and drive, moving up from Brooklyn, giving the best themed parties in Hollywood, always moving? Hearst's sons weren't ambitious, but here was Marion, this upstart actress, supporting her entire family just like Hearst did. She ran three homes in California gifted to her by Hearst, actually gifted to Marion's mother to hide the purchases from his former showgirl wife, Millicent Hearst. She starred in movies and raised her niece, Peppy Letterer, which you can learn about on this channel, and seemingly never got tired. Two years earlier, in 1922, there was another scandal at a Marion Davies party, and so Hearst, being very aware of these scandals, would have wanted to keep the Thomas Ince death very quiet. In 1922, Marion Davies' sister, Riney, gave her a welcome home party at her Freeport, Long Island vacation home. Riney was the mother of Peppy Letterer. The party ended abruptly just after midnight when electric mogul Oscar Hirsch, identified in the newspapers as a wealthy electrical manufacturer, took a bullet in the mouth from his wife Hazel's pearl-handled revolver, Tiffany, and many other manufacturers made such revolvers. The wound was not serious. The next morning, according to the newspaper accounts, Oscar and Hazel not only kissed and made up, but according to their attorney, vehemently declared that they will never again taste a drop of intoxicating liquor. This may have been an insert by Hearst, who also did not drink. The story would have merited no more than a back page mention in the Long Island papers had the Davies sisters not been involved and had Marion, on Hearst's advice, not had her attorney telephoned the New York papers to say that she had not been at the party. After the shooting, almost every non-Hearst newspaper in the city carried some version of the rich man's strangely shot Oscar Hirsch story on their front pages, the Daily News with a photograph of Miss Marion Davies' screen beauty. When this Long Island story died a natural death without Marion being further implicated, Hearst was probably enormously relieved. In the midst of his campaign for the gubernatorial nomination, he didn't need a whiff of new scandal to set off the retelling of old ones. On November 16, 1924, Ince boarded Hearst's lavish yacht, the Oneida, as a guest of honor. It was his 42nd birthday, and they were all sailing to San Diego. Chaplin Davies and actress Eleanor Glynn also boarded the yacht. Margaret Livingston, who was rumored to be Ince's lover, was there as well. Ince's wife, Nell, mourned him for some time after his death and did not marry again until 1930, which ended in divorce, and so she seems to have mourned a man she loved very much, so there is a question whether Livingston was Ince's uh, mistress or friend or simply rising starlet. The party celebrated Ince's birthday at dinner, and sometime afterward, he suffered acute indigestion. 
Since being burned, he had drunk champagne and eaten salted almonds, forbidden to him because he suffered from a peptic ulcer. Like I mentioned, this was part of health issues that had plagued him since he was burned at Innsville years earlier. Though allegations of a cover-up surfaced after his death, the real cover-up likely had to do with his failing health. He worked at a killing pace, founding studios left and right, and his co-workers had seen him double over in pain with indigestion. He also suffered chest pains and toward the end of his life, insomnia. A physician aboard the yacht, Dr. Daniel Carson Goodman, diagnosed Ince as extremely ill and having a severe heart attack after he was heard groaning in his cabin and vomiting profusely. Gretel Urban, a guest on the Oneida, remembered Chaplin being entertaining regardless, and everyone eating and drinking a good deal. Hearst warned Dr. Goodman not to tell anyone Ince, whom he referred to as his cosmopolitan executive, had taken sick on board the Oneida, which caused the doctor to lose his head and state total fabrications to complete strangers once the boat touched land, according to fellow guest Gretel Urban. A water taxi took Ince ashore and a train brought him to Los Angeles that November night. Ince got worse on the train and was taken off it at Del Mar, where he was treated at a hotel. He went home the next day, November 19th, and died. It is not clear if Nell was with him this entire time or was mad about his supposed mistress being on board and so stayed behind. It's just not clear. The death certificate stated Ince died of heart failure. But the front page of the Los Angeles Times ran headlines that said movie producer shot on Hearst yacht. Those headlines soon disappeared and the Hearst newspapers reported Ince had taken ill at Hearst's home, San Simeon. Chaplin's valet said he saw Ince bleeding from a bullet wound to the forehead. Was the newspaper rumor mill at first all Chaplin's doing so he could try to sink Hearst forever? After all, an America First newspaper man like Hearst, with a political campaign background, could really harm the upcoming World War II propaganda machine. Rumors proliferated about what really happened. The 61-year-old Hearst caught 35-year-old Chaplin and 27-year-old Davies in a compromising position on the Oneida and shot in spy accident. Hearst poisoned Ince, an assassin hired by Hearst killed Ince. Hearst, or Davies, stabbed Ince in the heart with Davies' hat pin. It was reported that the Oneida was considered Marion's yacht, diverting attention from Hearst, and she was the one who invited all the guests. The alleged perpetrator remained stuck on Hearst. Nobody ever delved into Chaplin, who was forcing Ince to eat all of these foods that triggered his indigestion, or any of the other sailors. Adding to the confusion were the lies and denials told by Hearst's guest. But before Ince's body was cremated, it lay in an open coffin for an hour for viewing, and no one saw that bullet hole in the forehead or anything else amiss. Regardless, the story has lived on in a mystery written by Hearst's granddaughter, Patty, Murder in San Simeon, and in a film called The Cat's Meow. What do you think happened? What was Marion Davies like at parties? Well, Marion may have gotten pregnant at some time during her long liaison with Hearst, but if that were the case, the probable outcome would have been an abortion. Alice Marble, the great tennis champion who visited often at St. Simeon in the 1930s, recalled in her oral history that when Marion and her friends hid away in Marion's dressing room where the women gathered to drink in secret, they would talk about their abortions. Fred Giles, Marion's biographer, thinks it quite probable that she had several abortions. That at least was the impression she gave a member of her family, who, desperate to help out a friend who had gotten a girl into trouble, asked Marion for advice. Was this Peppy Letterer? Did this help contribute to Peppy Letterer's demise? Marion lightly told her relative to give the name of Dr. So-and-so. He took care of all of mine, she said, and she wasn't laughing. 
The story rings true, but Giles followed it with the reminder that Marion was a cool lady with a joke, and after a few martinis, she often would say just about anything good for a laugh or a shock.